Okay, good morning and welcome to day five, the final day of Birmingham Tech Week. I'm really, really pleased with the session we've got next because I get asked a lot, what are the opportunities around the West Midlands? Um, and we've got a fantastic panel today that's going to be talking about just that. Why the West Midlands? Opportunities, talent, funding and community. And of course, you can join the conversation on LinkedIn and Twitter using the hashtags BTW2020 and Birmingham Tech Week. And of course, the week is being run in association with three great partners, Tech Nation, the West Midlands Grove Company and the Department for International Trade. And of course, West Midlands Grove Company and Department for International Trade are behind this particular session. And just want to say thank you for all the work they do across the United Kingdom, but specifically in the West Midlands to promote growth internationally, encourage inward investment and help organisations in the tech space export their products and services. So thank you for being a part of this week. And of course, thank you to our sponsors. The week would not be possible without you. Big thank you to NatWest, who are the headline sponsor this year, especially for the work they do in the region with their Entrepreneur Accelerator supporting tech entrepreneurs. And of course, Copper, Culture Group, BJSS, SciTrade, and DMET for all the work you do across the tech ecosystem. And a big thank you to our 2020 partners, um, Digital Culture, Media and Sport, of course, West Midlands Combined Authority and GBS LEP, as well as West Midlands 5G, who we're going to speak and um, hear from, sorry, later on as well. And as I said, this session is why the West Midlands opportunities, talent, funding and community. And I'm really pleased to be joined by some fantastic panellists. So we have Janice Ray, who is the CEO and founder of Tech Talent Academy, right at the forefront of digital skills. And then we have Robert Franks, who's a managing director of West Midlands 5G. And of course, 5G being such an integral part of the landscape of tech across the West Midlands. And then we have Howard Mitchell, head of innovation at HS2. Of course, HS2 giving us ability to be more connected than ever before. And then we have Ryan Cartwright, senior manager at British Business Bank. Of course, investment and funding, a key aspect of any tech entrepreneur and tech company's journey. And David Grady, then from Chief Financial Officer from the Birmingham 2022 Commonwealth Games. We're all very excited about that being on the horizon and everyone wants to be involved in some way, shape or form. And then last but not least, we've got Jack Stockport, who's a senior consultant in tech recruitment for SF Group. And of course, Jack, you know, at the forefront of making sure that we've got the right talent going into the right businesses as well. Um, and then we have our wonderful host from the Grove Company, of course, our partner, Nicola Wright, who is the tech and creative lead there. Um, so before I officially hand over to Nick, what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually play a little video and it kind of just sums up really what our region is all about. This is where it starts and where you remember it began. The incubator of your talent, your craft, your skill. Working as one to be healthier, happier, greener and stronger. We manufacture, we always have. We are bonded, held together by what we have made, redefining ourselves with what we are making. Our potential, our place here in the West Midlands, we build, create, achieve and exhilarate. Crafting art, creating wealth, making a difference. We've made history, but we're past that. We're building the future now in your West Midlands. I don't know about you, but that's the second time I've, I've seen that video. And every time I do, I, I just kind of get this overwhelming feeling of pride, you know, proud to be a, a Brummie. Um, so, you know, great kind of reflection of, of what we've going off uh, on across the region. So I'm going to hand over now to Nicola Wright to kind of take over from this session. Nick, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Yanis. Hoping that you could all hear the video OK, um, but we will feature that on our website and our social media so you can have another look at that. Um, so welcome to the West Midlands. We've got a lot of attendees who are brand new to our region. So I'll run through an introduction. 
Uh, before I hand over to our amazing panel of speakers today, who could talk to you about, again, the talent, the funding, the opportunities and our community. Um, so we're a region of three cities. We have Birmingham, Wolverhampton and Coventry. We're a region of creators, innovation and opportunities. From Birmingham's Jewellery Quarter and the Colmore Financial District to Leamington's Gaming Cluster and our automotive specialisms in Coventry. For years we've been known as the city of a thousand trades and we should stop shying away from this and actually be proud to be known as it. Um, so outside of London, we've been crowned the top location for startups in the UK for six years in a row now and top location for foreign companies to come and set up their operations for five consecutive years. And these additions have strengthened our entrepreneurial spirit, but also our contribution to emerging technologies every single year. So our accelerators and our incubator ecosystems are expanding and you'll learn more about those shortly. And they support the early journeys of our tech communities and they provide them with the knowledge, the networks, the collaboration and the funding that they need in order to grow. And Jim Sharp, which is our region's tech unicorn now, um, and they've been recently valued at a billion pounds. Um, they started their, their early journeys in Innovation Birmingham. And they're just a great example to show that these supportive hubs are so key to launching a business into success. Um, and you might be pleased to know that Innovation, are actually, Innovation Birmingham sorry, are actually bolstering their facilities. Um, they are soon going to build and open a brand new 11 floor, 210 million pound campus for our life sciences clusters and also to support even more businesses. So we also have three brand new 5G accelerators, which Robert will cover shortly. Um, but these are perfect additions for our tech communities to trial new innovations and to collaborate for new uses for 5G. And the West Midlands, as showcased in our video, is the perfect place for this, for this type of spirit. So we actually have major tech headquarters and major brand, global brand headquarters in the West Midlands. So the likes of BT, the likes of HSBC, and we have a huge amount of co-working and shared space options and with sector specific incubators we really are the perfect location for tech companies of any size. So we are located at the heart of the UK and this gives us unrivaled transport connectivity links. It gives us access to extremely large commuter talent pools. It enables us to be able to access clients easily right across the nation. And it's the ideal central location for companies now more than ever. So the COVID-19 pandemic has changed the ways that workforce, workforces operate. So people are now obviously remote working, but they are considering more suburban areas to live. They require more flexibility with their work-life balance and companies are now geographically removing the barriers that they previously had when they are recruiting, but also when they're investing. So that means with us being smack bang in the middle of England, we are the perfect location and the ideal choice for companies who are now considering a centrally located hub. And our region is also cost effective. So with only 80 minutes between the UK's first and second city, we're actually 30% cheaper to recruit for, to recruit in when compared to London and we are 50% cheaper for office spaces. And with our nine major universities and our region's combined authority pumping millions into digital skills, our talent pools are not only commercially sound, but they're highly skilled too. So we have HS2 and the Commonwealth Games in 2022 coming, and that will put our region in the global spotlight, which won't just create thousands of jobs, but it will create brand new opportunities for trade, for tourism and investment. And we'll get to hear a bit more about that shortly. So I hope that you've all used this week to learn, to share and to network and that you've found the ease of doing business here and the supportive communities easy to access. 
So I want to say a big hello and a, a great welcome uh, for all the international companies joining us today. And a really special thank you for the Department for International Trade for supporting this session. And I hope that you all find the session useful, whether you're from the region or brand new to it. So I'm going to hand over to Jack now from SF Group, who will give you a, a much broader overview on the talent. Good morning, guys. And firstly, thank you. Thank you to Nicola for, for a great introduction. And of course, to, to Yanis. Uh, I know it's been a really, really challenging, challenging few weeks and months for him and his team to kind of set up. But uh, Nicola's asked me to have a chat to you today about the kind of the talent pool in the West Midlands. Um, so I'm just going to kind of touch on three main key areas um, in the West Midlands. If I could just get my presentation to work. One sec. Sorry, guys. Here we go. So, um, so what the West Midlands talent pool, obviously kind of an absolute myriad of different reasons make up a talent pool. Um, but I've, I think the first thing to touch on is education, innovation and diversity. Um, the second is access to the talent pool. Um, and finally, kind of talent attraction. So, so the first kind of key point, education, innovation and diversity. Jack, um, you may need to reshare your slides. Okay. We're having a struggle with that. If you reshare your screen, we'll let you know when we can see it. Okay. There we go. We can see that now. We can see the Zoom. Do you want us to click into the slides? Yeah. There we go. Right, let me just catch up. Perfect. So yeah, the first thing, as I, as I mentioned, is, is the education and culture. Um, 12 universities and almost kind of pushing 10,000 kind of computer science graduates um, in, or students currently enrolled. Um, now that's a huge, huge kind of talent pool um, funneling into the kind of the commercial setting. And I think also for me, another key thing that I see on a day-to-day -day basis is the massive diversity across our, net, our, our region, 190 different cultures, you know, 26% of digital tech workers are from a BAME background compared to 15% UK average. And I think for any company um, considering kind of landing in the West Midlands, diversity has to be <clears throat> an absolute kind of key, a key kind of consideration when deciding where to base yourself. Um, I think research, again, is, is an absolute kind of key, key kind of setting. Um, as you can see there, <clears throat> almost 14,000 tech businesses supported by local universities in cutting edge AI and VR technology in the West Midlands. And as courses, as Nicholas just mentioned, 11% of the UK games workforce is, is based in the West Mids. Uh, and for me, what we do really, really well as a region is convert that educational prowess um, in, into kind of commercial entities and, and commercial success. Um, I, know, I know we have, I think Birmingham Uni do, it, do a great uh, initiative, uh, educate the educators where they go out um, and they talk to local businesses about what they need and then adapt their kind of courses um, to, to reflect that. Um, and it wouldn't, be, it wouldn't be fair on this slide not to mention how I feel kind of innovation is in our DNA. Um, obviously, as we all know, a massive automotive power hub willingly kind of supported by some great kind of local initiatives, Silicon Canal, obviously kind of the Birmingham Tech Week, tech talent, uh, women in tech, I think all create a real noise about the room um, and kind of a, a really kind of put us not on a UK map, but also on a, on a kind of a worldwide map. Then to kind of move on to the access to the West Midlands talent pool, um, again, I, th I think availability of the talent pool, a key stat that I was reading a couple of weeks ago, 85% of people moved or considered moving um, in the past 12 months. Now, that, that's, that's, that kind of, that's a really fluid talent pool. Um, and it really, for me, shows that the kind of people are considering uh, progressing their careers and really seeing what else is out there. Um, again, the talent pool, it's fair to say, is not as big as, as somewhere like or London. Uh, on, a, on a rough count I did earlier this week, around three and a half software developed. Um, but what we're not seeing is what I call kind of tech hoovers. 
you know, you only have to look at Manchester. Uh, you've got Bet365 in the BBC, um, in Leeds, uh, William Hill and Sky. And what they do is they hoover up a lot of tech talent. And if you're a new business landing there and can't compete with that infrastructure, it makes it really kind of tricky. Uh, and that's something I'm not kind of seeing in the region. Um, and finally, kind of, it, it goes without saying, obviously, given the climate, there's been a real move to kind of remote working. Um, and all of a sudden, um, places in the West Midlands have become kind of accessible. So, for example, a Wolverhampton software developer who perhaps didn't want to go to, to kind of Birmingham city centre now with increased transport links and connectivity and also the fact that they can kind of work from home a couple of days a week becomes a kind of a doable um, a journey. And so you can kind of expand your, your kind of talent pool. Um, the next thing to mention is the uh, variety. I think this, again, is, is a region we do incredibly well. 19,000 tech startups alone in the, in the West Midlands. And as you can see there from those stats, um, you know, FinTech, a massive offering, SciTech, EngTech. And again, you know, with, that's not that results in not a massive drain on one particular subsector of the, the tech ecosystem. Again, referencing Manchester, I know, I know kind of there's a massive digital and culture subsector there. Um, if you're if you're a kind of a young agency trying to land there and you don't have the employee value proposition uh, that, that perhaps the bigger guys do or the bigger companies do, um, you might struggle. And I, I just don't see that there. I, I, I think that that variety and diversity really, really helps. And finally, as, as Nick kind of mentioned briefly on, on kind of salaries, um, you know, we always do this kind of London to West Midlands comparison, but 22% but lower average tech wages than London for a cost effective region to, to kind of land in. Um, and finally, I wanted to touch on kind of attracting and maintaining tech talent. Obviously, I speak to hundreds of different kind of businesses um, across the region or almost on a kind of a monthly basis. And these are kind of three key areas that I think I think I kind of get asked a lot and, and kind of see for really kind of attracting and maintaining that tech talent. Um, first is a kind of a strong employee value proposition. There's, there's probably not kind of a director or senior manager out there who doesn't think their business is, is, is kind of one of the best. But really, what makes you stand out? Uh, what are the perks and benefits of, of your company? Are you developing or are you working cutting edge tech? Do you offer some great perks around remote working, flexible working, um, talent, talent uh, and kind of training benefits? And also kind of key to consider what level are you, are you looking to kind of recruit at? Are you looking to bring in a couple of senior guys um, and then kind of fill that and fill and encourage juniors um, and kind of mid-level staff uh, into your business? I think uh, really kind of nailing out what exactly is your hiring strategy is absolutely kind of key. Um, the next point is, is the landing. So actually kind of starting up in the region. Um, again, depending on the talent pool that you're trying to attract, you've got to really give this some thought. Um, for example, if, if you're looking to take on those junior staffs, a lot of them still don't drive. Um, and so a central office with good transport links, I think is absolutely key as they need that kind of increased face time from, from kind of senior managers to develop and, and learn. Um, and I think another key point is engage with the community around you. You know, nine times out of 10, the staff that you'll be hiring are from the region. They probably worked in some of your competitors in other kind of tech companies. So ask what they think, what's worked in other companies, what can you bring? And then finally, in kind of your, your growth, so your scale up phase, um, something I get asked almost on a daily basis is the kind of the long term personal development. What does that what does the tech talent pool journey with you look like? Um, and be adaptable and flexible. Um, unfortunately, I see so many companies who just who just still don't don't offer that kind of flexibility around remote working uh, or flexible working hours. And I think if you can offer that, you attract a whole new talent pool uh, and maintain them long term. And finally, kind of deliver a great candidate experience. You know, even if for, for whatever reason um, that that kind of a candidate wasn't successful. Um, do do kind of communicate that with them. The, the industry is, is very uh, integrated and, and people kind of talk. So if, if you can kind of deliver a great candidate experience, then you're really on your way to a great kind of reputation. Um, so that's about it from me. Um, I will hand you over to Janice, but if you'd like to discuss anything further, my, my kind of contact details are, are on the bottom. And, and thank you very much for, for listening. Thanks, Jack. Thank you. Um... I am just going to share my screen for a second. Um, here we go. 
Hopefully you can see that. Can everyone see that? Yeah, perfect. Brilliant. Okay, so I have five minutes to uh, to talk to you about empowering diverse talent um, and inspire you in some of the, the great work that's happening um, in the West Mid Midlands region. Um, so Tech Talent Academy um, set up in the West Midlands this year um, against a backdrop of um, there being very few women, as we know, working in the tech sector. So current stats are exact number, I think 16.8% of the, the UK sec tech sector are female. Um, the figures increased by a tiny percentage over the past five years. Um, and this, this picture here is my experience of learning to code a very long time ago in, in 1987, where it was a very male dominated um, sector. And it, and it still is. And I wanted to show you, um, to contrast this with one of our uh, students this year, Rafaro Chibando, who is um, a woman of colour, who has just come through her university university degree in computer science and has had exactly the same experience as me. So that's over 30 years apart. Um, it shows you that we've got a huge amount of work to do in this space and these interventions are absolutely critical. Um, and against that number that we looked at previously, that very small number, there's an even smaller number, a tiny fraction um, of the tech community are from a BAME background. So much work to do in this space. But the exciting thing is that we're on, on a mission to change this um, and we are changing it. So working in partnership with the West Midlands Combined Authority, we have set out to create a much more gender diverse uh, pool of talent for the tech sector. Um, in a four month period this year, we engaged with over 3000 women who are desperate to move into tech. Uh, we've trained up 200 women so far. We've given them a very valuable skill set in software engineering, data engineering and cybersecurity. And we're on track to, uh, to train another, uh, to train up to 300 women by the end of February. And 60% of our trainees are from a BAME heritage. Uh, which is really exciting because we know that we're reaching out to the, exactly the sort of, you know, exactly the group that we want to, to help. And I think this really shows that this sort of impact that these interventions can have, because without this, we would be 300 women less in tech. So this, this sort of work is absolutely critical. We are the role models um, that the industry needs. We are techies ourselves, we're coders, we're enthusiasts, we love tech, we love all the innovation that it provides. Um, but we're very conscious that uh, there's not an awful lot of innovation around diversity and inclusion, and that's what we're trying to sort out. So we're here to support the tech sector, we're here to provide that bridge between, uh, the, between the residents and the community and uh, the employers to make tech um, a great space to work, you know, to position it as a, as a great career choice for everyone, which it absolutely is. Um, and really to inspire people um, that we can support, support them on that journey into tech. So in terms of what we do, we provide a technical skill set. We also coach and mentor our students. We connect with industry to open up those job opportunities. And that is a really critical point because um, although we're doing this valuable work, we cannot magic up the opportunities. We are uh, relying on industry to come forward and to share those opportunities so that we can connect them with the talent pool that they're looking for. And, and the other thing that we're made very mindful of is, of course, that this problem is not just doesn't suddenly appear in the workplace. It's happening at a much, a much younger age. So it happens in school. And therefore, we've engaged with um, BCS and also CAS Computing at School to be able to reach out to young people and uh, provide those role models and show them that the tech sector is, is a great place to work for everyone. Um, so, so over time, we'll have these 300 students that we have trained up and moved into work and be able to share those great stories and case studies with school children to provide some uh, much needed evidence for them that they can see their own models there themselves. 
So the number at the bottom, bit, bit of a scary number here, <laughs> but uh, it's predicted we're going to be looking for 1.6 million people in the UK to move into the tech sector in the next two years. So that is an additional 1.6 million people. Um, now this number was from prior to the pandemic, so it's clearly going to rise. Um, if anyone has any ideas where we find these 1.6 million techies, answers in a postcard, please. <laughs> but you can see, hopefully this demonstrates the need to be able to do this work um, and to do it at scale, because clearly if we can find those people, it's going to affect tech businesses, it's going to affect the growth of the economy. Um, it, it's, you know, critical work to be able to put this skill set out um, to as many people as we can. So hopefully I've been able to convince you that there are thousands of women looking for opportunities in tech. We are here to connect you with them. We will help you build um, a diverse talent pipeline with a ready-made skill set. So a, a, a highly valuable skill set, software engineering, data engineering, cybersecurity. And academies are also a great place for employers to find diverse talent. So you will... Um, Basically, it works like a, a long interview process. You get the, the ability to connect with a group of people, get to know them. You get to see the great work they're producing, the passion behind what they're doing um, and build relationships with them. And that will really help you to, to create a great tech business, which mirrors and reflects the, um, your customer base, your uh, your client base um, and this and you know the community that you're trying to reach out to so that's all from me for now um, I am going to hand you across to Robert Franks um, who is the MD of West Midlands 5G to talk about all things 5G thanks everyone fantastic thanks Janice I'm just going to try and uh, try and share my screen oh can you see that yeah, okay, I'm getting getting nods. Um, so I think I've got 10 minutes to uh, to quickly introduce the 5G opportunity and uh, uh, hopefully why uh, many of you will uh, want to come and work with us on, uh, on 5G opportunities. Um, so I wanted to start by just making or, or reiterating probably a couple of observations that I've heard from uh, people throughout Birmingham Tech Week, but I think it's important context uh, before I go on and talk about 5G and the opportunity in the region. So the first observation is that the West Midlands has had a fantastic growth story over the last decade leading up to the pandemic. We've seen the fastest GDP growth outside of London. Um, as I think Jack was saying, you know, in Birmingham, the second most popular location for startups in the UK outside of London uh, and continuously growing, uh, uh, growing employment. Uh, clearly, though, we're now facing uh, a major challenge, as indeed is every other part of the world as well. And some of that challenge is due to the nature of our industries and some of our strengths. Clearly, what's interesting, though, and, and, and also, I guess, uh, I guess exciting about, um, uh, about the nature of the pandemic, though, is that it's accelerating the adoption of digital trends. We can see that in the short term through the amazing growth of e-commerce, uh, which is, for example, 50% higher uh, than it was on a like-for-like -like basis uh, before, the, um, before the start of the pandemic. But we can also see all sorts of new use cases emerging. So, for example, things like remote GP appointments um, and telehealth had a very, very low adoption before the pandemic, but have started to creep up. And I believe that the acceleration of these digital trends creates an opportunity for the West Midlands and hopefully for other parts of the UK and the world to accelerate economic recovery. Within the context of these accelerating trends, 5G is going to be one of the breakthrough technologies, along with technologies like AI, for example, uh, in the next decade. Um, and 5G is important, and, and I'll come on to give some real examples of this, I, I guess not, not just because uh, it, enables, uh, it enables smartphones to operate more quickly, although it will enable speeds of 10 to 100 times faster than 4G. But it's also important because it's a technology that's specifically designed for the Internet of Things. So it's specifically designed not only to help consumers, 
but it's also designed to help industry as well. And I'll come on and talk a little bit more about the use cases. So 5G, as well as being faster, can connect up to 20 times more uh, devices per square kilometer. So as everything in our lives becomes connected, from our cars to our clothing, to our homes, to our offices, uh, to the infrastructure uh, on the road and the railways, it, 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 it facilitates that. And it also enables uh, data not only to be passed uh, very quickly, but also to be passed at a guaranteed uh, fast speed if necessary. And that's very important for certain types of applications, like, for example, making sure that data comes back on a manufacturing production line in real time, or that medical uh, diagnosis can happen in real time uh, remotely. So that's a little bit about 5G. Um, but, but the reality is the benefits of 5G, as, as with most new technologies, are, are not just going to happen automatically. In order for our region and in order for the UK to get the benefits of 5G, we need billions of pounds to be invested in rolling out new technology. 5G is not a software update to 4G networks. It involves new hardware being rolled out on top of buildings. It involves people buying new equipment, whether that's uh, smartphones like the iPhones we've seen uh, launched uh, earlier this week or whether it's IoT devices and, 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 um, and at the moment it is very expensive and very difficult for a number of reasons to roll out those, um, those mobile phone networks. Um, the second thing we need to do though is it's obviously not just about the network, having, having a great network doesn't necessarily create innovation and benefits by itself. We need to get together the, the, the demand side and the supply side of different ecosystems and we need to support them to innovate, not just using 5G, but using a whole host of technologies to solve real problems for real uh, end users and real businesses. So in the West Midlands, we, we've had the privilege to, uh, to lead the UK, UK's uh, largest uh, regional 5G testbed, which is the business I lead, WM5G. We won that on a, uh, about 18 months or so after a competition that the central government uh, ran to, uh, to find a region uh, to do that. So fundamentally, we've got two, two key 5G objectives in the region. The first is to accelerate the deployment of 5G and fiber networks. And I'll go on to say a little bit about where we are with this, but we're not actually rolling out the network ourselves. What we're doing is we're working in partnership with the mobile operators and the councils to effectively create the conditions where they can invest much more in 5G and therefore get the network into our region much quicker uh, in the West Midlands. And then secondly, we are working to convene or pull together uh, lots of innovation work across different verticals where the West Midlands has particular strength, where we believe 5G can make a difference, and where, where we believe there's a case for, uh, for, for intervention to accelerate that, uh, that engagement. So let me say very quickly where we are on the network side, first of all, and then the innovation side. So on the network side, I'm delighted to say that as of the end of August, um, the West Midlands and Birmingham specifically have the best 5G coverage so far out of any city or any combined authority region in the UK. Now, clearly it's very early days for 5G coverage. So 5G was only launched in the UK commercially about a year ago. Um, and what we're seeing so far is just the city centers starting to be covered, although there is a lot of work upgrading uh, 5G masts from 4G to 4G and 5G in, uh, in, in suburban areas as well. Um, and one of the reasons why we're off to such a great start in the West Midlands uh, with 5G is because over the last 12 months, West Midlands 5G has worked extensively with the local authorities and the operators to make the West Midlands the easiest place, the most straightforward place to invest in rolling out 5G networks. And that's why places like Wolverhampton, for example, had 5G launched in it six to 12 months earlier than would have taken place otherwise, and a number of other areas across our region. So really the West Midlands is off to a cracking start in having the 5G network in place. And to try and capitalize on that lead on the network, uh, we've been working very closely with uh, with Yanni and the startup uh, community to launch the UK's first 5G accelerators, which Nicola briefly mentioned. So these are uh, innovation hubs. They're, they're buildings that are launching in Birmingham, uh, in Coventry, and also in Wolverhampton, um, as well as being available, obviously, online. And the idea of these facilities is to enable two things to happen. So firstly, to enable organizations of any size, 
whether it's a public sector organization or a business, to come along and to find out what 5G is, to experience it, and to start to think through what that can mean for their business. The second objective then of these facilities is to encourage some of those exciting startups that exist in Birmingham, other parts of the region, and indeed even outside the region, uh, to come and innovate in developing new products and services using 5G. Uh, we have, we're just about to launch our Green Innovation Challenge, where we'll be seeking to uh, attract companies who are looking at low carbon innovations, uh, and, over, and we'll be running a series of other uh, innovation challenges and competitions working with those, those companies. Over the next few years, we hope to engage over 2,000 businesses and other organizations through these facilities and hopefully, uh, hopefully uh, develop some really exciting new products and services. In addition to the accelerators, um, we've also um, st started to run a number of small and, and also large scale 5G trials. And that's also something else we're continuing over the next 18 months. So if I briefly give a couple of examples before I wrap up. So uh, for example, last summer, we conducted the uh, UK's first uh, connected ambulance remote uh, uh, health uh, uh, trial. So we effectively demonstrated the potential to enable a paramedic in an ambulance that could be many miles away from a hospital to conduct an ultrasound scan using the speed of 5G to, uh, to transmit the image from the ultrasound scan probe back to a GP at the hospital who could guide the paramedic in terms of positioning the probe and help with earlier diagnosis of conditions and therefore providing the right treatment at point of need. We have just completed a number of uh, relating to the transport system, and some of these are particularly relevant in a COVID environment of trying to think how we can safely uh, encourage people back onto public transport. Uh, one of them involved uh, live CCTV trams on uh, trials on, on trams, which can identify uh, a whole host of issues, including problems with social distancing. And we've also done a number of trials around real time uh, traffic monitoring. Looking ahead into next year, we've really got three big areas we're focused on driving further innovation in addition to the accelerators. The first is more work on health and social care. So we are in the process of conducting pilots around uh, residential care homes and also um, early cancer diagnosis using 5G technologies, something that I think we're all very aware of is, 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 are areas that need acute support given, given the situation again with COVID. We're also, do, we're also launching our manufacturing test bed. And finally, uh, we are doing more work on transport and extending out our real-time traffic monitoring. So in summary, uh, in summary, I'm really excited to be with you uh, here today. Um, I believe that 5G has the potential to be one of those technologies that can help uh, accelerate our progress as a region and beyond towards economic and social recovery. And I believe thanks to the work we're doing in having the best network in the region, having these innovation facilities through the accelerators and having this other innovation work going on, hopefully we are a region that's compelling for many, uh, for many businesses and many individuals to come and experience 5G and hopefully drive a lot of innovation and benefits off the back of it. So that's it from me. Now, Nicola, apologies, I've completely forgotten who I'm handing to. That's okay. Sorry, I have dropped you a quick note. Oh, sorry, it's late. Um, we're now handing over to Howard from HS2, please. Have I got that correct? I yeah, might that, have that, yeah, that's what was on my yes, list. Yes, we have. Apologies. Yes, please pass over to Howard. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, are my slides now available, uh, visible? They are indeed. Brilliant. Thank you. Well, um, some fascinating uh, insights from um, some of my uh, board, uh, some of the uh, other people on this uh, panel, which is um, really interesting, for, certainly for me. Um, uh, we as HS2 um, are based in Birmingham. Uh, so we are a centrally located uh, organization. And I, I would like to just give a few 
um, facts and insights about the scale of the program and the undertaking that we have at HS2 before we then go into some more of the specifics around how people can get involved with um, what is a very significant program both in my area which is um, innovation specifically but then also uh, it, via our standard procurement process so how you can become one of our suppliers or vendors within that program um, which I'll now just give a few insights into. Um, in April, we got noticed to proceed for the first phase of HS2, which is now under construction, um, and that is the dark blue section at the bottom of this slide, uh, in between London Euston and Birmingham Curzon Street. Um, in itself, that is a one of the largest undertakings and mega projects um, currently working, uh, uh, currently underway in the whole of Europe. It is we have four major stations being built, uh, stations that are the size of, uh, in some instances, um, airport terminal type buildings, and then in between several hundred um, uh, miles of track. Um, that will uh, move all the way through eventually uh, to the north of England and interconnect with all of the existing uh, railway system. Um, it's connecting 30 million people um, and at peak will probably be uh, uh, an employer of around 30,000 people just within the first phase um, and it is now underway. Um, as a, a project, uh, the undertaking that we have uh, is absolutely huge. And just to put that into context, what I wanted to do is share a few facts. So really in that say uh, if we just look at the amount of tunneling going on so the si over 64 miles of tunneling that is more than the uh, the channel tunnel um, we have over a million tons of steel being implemented 200 live construction sites which will be needing and using new technologies to ensure that they are both efficient and uh, minimizing the environmental impact of those construction sites. 2,000 different machines moving at any particular time. Um, we are building a significant amount of new structures uh, to support the railway. And so there is a need for both um, a digital and design economy to support us with that as we start to develop and use new techniques and technologies all the way through the railway. As mentioned, 30,000 peaks in the construction sector. Traditionally, the construction sector has doesn't always have the benefit of some of the more um, geographically independent um, uh, technologies where you, you can work from home. We need to be on site, but our people who are on site also need access to new digital, digital technologies to allow them to be very, very efficient in the way that they work. Um, we also will then have an ongoing operation in and around this railway where we have several different interfaces, whether that's a human uh, machine interface with how people trans uh, move around our stations or how we transport, uh, transport goods on the uh, traditional railway network, but also a real time understanding of how we interface and our rolling stock interfaces with the traditional railway. So it's a huge undertaking with uh, a number of opportunities in and around the, the whole country, but specifically we are headquartered in the West Midlands region and a lot of our activity is based there at present. Um, one of the things that I look at specifically is innovation across that mega project. And within that, um, I look at four very, very specific areas. The first being in uh, technology for construction and design. So how can we undertake that activity and improve uh, all of our productivity? How can we be doing things better? And we're working with a number of different universities in the space, notably uh, Birmingham and Loughborough, um, to understand how we can sort of develop new technologies. But because we will be building this railway for a significant uh, period of time, we can take new ideas from a point of genesis through to commercial adoption, which is not something that you get 
very often because projects don't run to the scale and the time uh, the, the amount of time that HS2 has. The next area, obviously, we, we look at how we can do more with less in terms of emissions of the project and carbon is at the forefront. Being able to quantify, manage carbon and uh, avoid unnecessary wastage, but also um, where possible, new, use new materials and technologies to reduce the embodied carbon within the railway. We are always really very interested to speak to people about, and that's something that we want to um, uh, ask anybody who has great ideas to please come forward and speak to us. Customer experience, as I mentioned, as you uh, go on your journey from point of buying a ticket all the way through to arriving at your destination, it's not as simple as just point A to B. That may mean that you have to get to the station. How can you get to the station? How, does your, how do you park or um, uh, use public transportation? If you are interchanging onto uh, the, the, the London transport system or in fact onto the existing rail network, how do we integrate that experience meet so that people can get from point A to B with as minimal anxiety as possible? And how do they traverse through those stations and make sure that those stations are completely accessible to all users? Great ideas in that space. And I'm working with a number of different uh, startup organizations who have some wonderful innovations that will allow this to be the most accessible railway ever. The final area, which is probably the one that is not as uh, attractive and certainly many members of my team uh, prefer the other areas, but process. So where can we transfer huge volumes of data more effectively and with less error uh, through uh, several different organizations uh, who are working with us in the supply chain to build this railway? So any innovations that are in that space, we also uh, are always looking for partners in that space. And, and for the people on the call who have uh, any great ideas, or would like to participate in our accelerator program, um, please access our, our website. I've listed it at the bottom of the slide. We now have, uh, well, we shortly will have 10 new companies that um, HS2 will work with um, in terms of getting new startup businesses from across the UK into the uh, HS2 program. The final area uh, that I'll mention in terms of more traditional procurement um, how can you get involved with the tenders and the things that we have active at the moment, the opportunities to, uh, for your, you or your organisations to take part uh, in that very significant programme that I've mentioned. So, first of all, I would uh, ask you all to go to our website um, where you can find our innovation uh, information as well as the supplier guidance and take a little bit of time to look at that. Um, we have a standard process for you to um, uh, register your organizations. Um, people think that uh, the vast majority of our suppliers are huge tier one organizations. Actually, that's not the case. Uh, within our supply chain, we are vast majority small, medium sized enterprises and local businesses. So please uh, don't be put off and come forward register and participate in, in the process. Um, there are a number of different supply chain resources available and the supply chain school is a great one. Uh, we would ask you to have a look at that because working with programs of this uh, size have a, a very specific um, characteristic. Uh, they are not as quick as some of my the, the colleagues who've spoken before, uh, certainly around um, digital or some of the 5G elements. We take a bit longer and we would like everyone to, to come into that sort of uh, understanding with their eyes open that this is not a quick turnaround, but actually it can be a, a very good long term relationship for those people who who come and join us over time. Um, we, I would say work with uh, organisations uh, such as Growth uh, West Midlands, uh, the, the different chambers of commerce and uh, your, your different local um, uh, your LEPs. We, we have uh, weekly meetings um, where we speak to different organizations from across the route 
and we do take uh, a lot of the, uh, our innovations and suppliers through uh, those relationships. And then the final part, I would say, please contact us directly. Um, the, if you have innovative ideas that you would like to prove in the programme, my uh, contact details can be found on the website. And also uh, the application process for our accelerator is on there. And then my colleagues in procurement can also be found there um, from uh, the supply chain perspective. Um, that's all I have to say. And uh, I think, let me just check who I have to hand over to. Uh, I am handing over to David, David Brady. from the Commonwealth Games. Thank you, Howard. Okay. Thanks, Howard. Uh, thanks, everyone. Um, Howard, can you uh, stop sharing so I can share? Thanks very much. Uh, there we go. Um, Good morning, everybody, and, and thanks to the team at the Combined, uh, the Combined Authority and Growth Company for inviting us today to give an update on the Commonwealth Games. Um, I guess uh, there's, there's a key message that I'd like to uh, give everyone today, which is, you know, the Commonwealth Games is a great opportunity for the region. It, it, it sounds sort of self-evident, but the, uh, uh, the reality of the opportunity, probably um, more so than ever in, in the current circumstances, I think the opportunity broadly I would describe as, you know, there is a, a direct commercial opportunity. Um, we are spending money and therefore um, uh, opportunities in that regard. But there's also this, the broader sort of catalytic effect um, of having an event um, such as the Commonwealth Games in the region. Um, beyond the, the economic, um, the, the Games has got, you know, cultural, community and, and sustainability objectives. And, you know, those are clearly great opportunities for the region to, to sort of advance on the broader front than simply the economic and, and the games have got an important part to play in that regard. Um, and lastly, I guess, in terms of opportunity, I think more, more than ever now, um, an event like the Commonwealth Games is an opportunity for hope. Uh, everybody needs a bit of light at the end of the tunnel. And I think um, that 2022 date um, looks like uh, at this point in the cycle, a really credible um, thing to hang on to in terms of things will be better by then. And the games is really um, a great thing to, to be focusing on in, in that sort of time horizon. So I'll give you a little bit more um, detail if I can, um, if I can get these slides to go down. <laughs> Seem to be stuck. Maybe just... picking on the slides, yeah. Ah, there we go. Thank you very much. So, as I said, you know, this is a good news story, and 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 the team at the Commonwealth Games are, are very aware of the the privileged position they're in, in 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 terms of, you know, we are um, cracking on. So, regardless of the the wider challenges um, in in the economy out there, with the, with the timetable we've got, it, it's not business as usual for obvious reasons, but it is very much open for business at, at the games. So procurement and recruitment um, proceeding to, to the previous plans because uh, the deadline uh, won't move. And hopefully that's, that's a good news story um, um, in, the, in the broader business uh, and uh, wider community in, in, in the region. Um, the whole point about um, bringing games to a region um, is to uh, bring a boost um, uh, uh, at every level of, of society um, and when you through, through any lenses. Um, so we're talking about jobs, we're talking about skills, we're working with the Combined Authority on the, on the TTI programme. Uh, and obviously, along with the Games, comes infrastructure uh, improvements, be they uh, transport or, or residential improvements. You will see those around the city um, uh, ongoing at the current time. Uh, and, you know, when I talk about the, the, the sort of the broader social objectives, we, we have an objective of bringing people together. I think, you know, whilst we weren't aware of it when we set those objectives, you know, now more than ever, those, those kind of opportunities to come together were, are, are sorely missed um, in the wider world. And, and um, we're very much looking forward to working with everyone on this call and, and everyone in the region um, to showcase Birmingham uh, sort of in, in 2022. Uh, Birmingham and the region showing um, what the art of the possible is in, in a post-COVID world. So I'm not going to read all these numbers out because you, you can read those for yourself, but I will just pick up a few um, uh, for those of you that, that haven't focused on the games at all uh, at, at this point in time. Um, 2.4 billion uh, citizens in Commonwealth countries across across the world. That's, that's just under a third of the world's population. 
um, is living in a country that, that will be attending the games in, in some way, shape or form. And the good news, if, if, if uh, you're advertising or sponsoring the games, is that a lot of them will watch it on television. You know, so outside uh, Football World Cup and Olympics, this is one of the most watched events um, globally um, uh, at the current time. Uh, in terms of uh, roles, games times roles, so the, the organising committee itself will have an, uh, a workforce of about uh, 1,000 people, just over, uh, come games time, 10,000 volunteers, and then on top of that, in the supply chain and working um, around the games, we'll, we'll aggregate up to about just over 40,000 uh, games times roles. I'm going, to, I'm going to mention the cultural programme, um, given, given the audience today and, and the innovation in all of that. So as well as the opening and closing ceremonies, which, which form part of the Games, the Games also has a, a standalone cultural programme um, that will be in and around the region at Games times, runs slightly longer than the Games, runs 22 days. Um, but on top of that, you, you may already have picked up in, in the newspapers, as announced earlier this year, the, the organising committee, in addition to running the games, is, is also uh, curating the uh, UK-wide uh, Festival 2022, which is a, a, a festival um, to showcase the UK's creativity and innovation. And many of you will have bumped into my colleague Martin Green, who is, is in charge of all things um, cultural um, at the organising committee. He's also uh, running Festival 2022 um, out, of the, out of the OC. Um, boost to the regional economy. Uh, we're spending money, but the expected sort of impact on the regional uh, economy in aggregate based on previous games is um, north of a billion pounds. Um, which obviously at this current time of, of economic challenges is uh, would be welcome in any region. So we do think as um, uh, as members of the West Midlands region, this is a great, uh, a great news story um, uh, at the current time. I, I often get asked about the funding. Um, effectively, the funding for the games uh, is, is shared three to one between central and local government. So uh, the, uh, the, the, the regional councils will be investing uh, one pound to every three that the, the national government invests um, in the games. So moving on, um, just a little bit about um, the game specifically, you, you know, our, we expect to be procuring um, just over 300 million pounds worth of contracts in order to deliver the games. The organising committee is not the only procuring um, organisation within the games, because as well as what, what we need to buy, there are clearly the infrastructure projects um, ongoing, which are largely going to be procured by Birmingham City Council and Sandwell um, um, Metropolitan Borough Council. Um, uh, the uh, uh, Transport for West Midlands colleagues at uh, Combined Authority um, obviously have a lot of procurement going on with the infrastructure improvements um, that are running in parallel with the games there. Uh, we have a social values charter. So for those of you that are interested in procurement with the games, the, the, the organising committee is an arm's length body of government. And so public contract regulations apply. We have a social values charter, which forms part of those uh, tender processes uh, and all available on our website. Um, our workforce uh, will double in 2020, um, but as I say, we're, we're sort of close to 200 now, but we'll be 1,000 come games times. Um, and really, uh, uh, encouragingly, we've, we've just um, launched with uh, the Combined Authority of Jobs and Skills Academy um, to run with the games, so that when we talk about volunteers and when we talk about um, roles, games times roles, we're, we're leaving something beyond the short-term um, hit of those roles. We're actually creating skills um, in the people who take those roles, which are transferable and, and, and available um, in the regional economy after the Games. And, and ourselves as an organisation, uh, we've got plans to recruit um, up to about 40 apprenticeships um, in the next uh, three or four months um, in order to um, do our part in, in, in the skills mix for the region. This is broadly how the procurement looks. It's probably slightly um, front loaded for the, for, from the perspective of potential suppliers, because this is when we start working on procurements internally, but you'll see that we are absolutely at, at sort of peak load in our procurement activity at the moment. It's probably not unsurprising given that most of these um, procurements are, are fairly complex now in terms of big, big procurements and have quite a long tail in terms of finally awarding contracts. So it's good that we're busy now because we might be a little bit late um, if we weren't. Uh, this is where you find out all about 
uh, active uh, opportunities uh, within the games. So all opportunities are on our website and and obviously on, under the um, public contract regulations. Um, material contracts are on uh, Contracts Finder. And if you need to know anything about the games, you can find us on all the usual platforms uh, with those uh, with those um, handles or, and addresses. Uh, and now I'm going to hand you on to Ryan Cartwright from the British Business Bank. Thanks, David, and thanks, Nick, for inviting me to today's session, and congratulations, Yanis, on a fantastic week. Uh, I'm just going to try and share my screen so everybody can see that. Okay. Hopefully everyone can see that, okay? Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, so I've been working in the West Midlands uh, for about 20 years now. And for the last two years, I've been part of the British Business Bank. Um, and what I've been amazed with really over the past two years um, is the real concerted effort by people like Yanis um, to develop really well-formed <clears throat> and what I would call really impactful ecosystems in the West Midlands. There seems to be a real culture of collaboration in the West Midlands, particularly around the tech sector, um, and a real shared vision to make the West Midlands region um, a leader in tech and digital innovation. Um, so just move through my slides, uh, just in the interest of time, I will skip through uh, that one. Um, when I joined the British Business Bank a couple of years ago, um, as an organisation, we weren't that well known. Um, but over the last kind of six months or so, as the pandemic has hit, um, I suppose our profile has significantly increased because we've been supporting delivery of COVID support schemes. So you've probably heard of the bounce back loans and the coronavirus business interruption loan scheme. Um, and it would be uh, remiss of me not to mention these, given we're talking about businesses accessing finance in the region um, and lots of businesses, over 100,000 businesses have already accessed support through both these schemes. Uh, over four billion pounds gone out to um, all manner of businesses across the West Midlands. And these schemes are still open. Uh, they run to the end of November. So if you still need some funding for your business, uh, please do apply uh, for those schemes. It's surprising, I mean, we, we weren't that well known, but um, prior to supporting those COVID schemes, we had lots of other schemes that were, that, that were already going and supporting uh, around six billion pounds worth of funding to SMEs in the year that I joined. Um, as you can see, what we try to do is support businesses through all stages of their life cycle. So from startup through to scale up and, and, and to stay ahead as well. We do that across both kind of debt and equity products. And sometimes it's really difficult as a business to, to work out, well, how do I fund my business? How do I fund that growth? Is it equity or is it debt? And I think a lot of the time what we do is, is we stick to what we know. Uh, loans or debt, um, fairly simple. We know how they're structured. Uh, we know how they work. Uh, so it's really, uh, it's really hard sometimes to step out of that comfort zone and explore other options. What I would say though is there may be better options for you to fund your business growth and to scale up, um, depending on what sector you're in and depending on what kind of, um, how much growth you want over the, the coming years. So equity might be a preferred option to debt. What you do need to do is know exactly what you're looking for and what the investor or the lender is looking for as well. You need to be prepared um, so you can put the best kind of pitch together and give yourself the best chance of getting a successful application for funding. And what's, again, what's great about the West Midlands is the collaboration between the support organisations that are based here. And then once you're plugged into the right people and the right networks, there's always somebody that knows the right person. There's always somebody there that could help. And this really is true. The West Midlands has it all. Um, whether you're looking for angel investors or um, just trying to prove a new concept, uh, or even just the lane where your, your, your current funder just can't support. Uh, the region has a real depth and breadth uh, of options for you to explore. I think it's been mentioned already, um, lots of accelerators, 40 plus accelerators and incubators in the region. Uh, again, second only to London. Uh, some amazing university assets that we've got, um, the big four kind of advisory firms, but also for, for smaller businesses or startup businesses, we have uh, individual mentors and non-exec directors that can really add value um, to your business. So I think it is absolutely all right here in the West Midlands. And that final point, there is absolutely a spirit of collaboration um, across the region, which is great. Now there are so many options to, to, to consider. And if you don't know uh, about all the support that's available and don't know where to begin, a great starting point would be um, a local growth hub. 
we've got six in the region and as well as the likes of the West Midlands Growth Company, Tech Nation, DIT, they can really offer some great support and advice, not just around finance, um, but around anything in terms of helping you grow your business and some good signposting as well. So I would absolutely um, suggest go and speak to one of those, the six in the region, so, so go and check them out. One of the programmes that the British Business Bank has been running for a while is Startup Loans, uh, a really good product of support for new businesses. So if you're less than two years old, you can access up to 25K per director, and that's up to a maximum of about 100K. Um, it's not just about the money now, you also receive 12 months worth of free mentoring and also support to um, build your business plan, create cash flow forecasts and really support that initial stage of your business growth. In my opinion, this is, whenever you're applying for finance or investment, you should always consider what is the added value over and above the pound notes. So what is that investor, what is that funder going to bring to the party as well as just the money? How do I get more bang for my buck is what I'm, I'm kind of suggesting is, is one of the big questions that you ask. One of the other schemes that we've got in the West Midlands, and I'm really fortunate to have really, is the Midlands Engine Investment Fund. Uh, now this, uh, or, or MEIF for short, uh, this is a, a pot of money, £250 million, which is there to support your business when mainstream lenders, mainstream investors um, are not quite ready to support or your business is not quite where they, they want to see it. It's made up of small business loans, larger debt finance, proof of concept equity, and later stage equity finance as well. And like it says there, it's to support businesses at, uh, at various different stages in their, uh, in their business journey, from £25,000 up to £2 million. Um, it's really useful kind of gap fund uh, there for businesses uh, in the West Midlands. And we've got five fund managers that deliver this um, for us. Uh, again, they're all very experienced. They're based in the West Midlands, very personable approach to their investments, looking to add as much value as they can, like I say, over and above just the money. Their main aim, same as ours, is to see businesses in the West Midlands grow, thrive and create jobs. And through our marketing and comms team, we also seek to promote these investments as much as possible. There are so many great businesses in the region receiving this investment and we really should be shouting them, shouting about them a lot more. In my opinion, we need to showcase the diverse range of businesses that, that actually call West Midlands their home. Um, but don't just take it from me. I'm going to try and play you a little video, uh, a case study from one of our uh, investee companies. So let me just pop this. Bear with me a moment. Should be coming up. Sorry about this. Ah, here we go. Hi, I'm Claire Vale, MD of Sign Solutions. We're based in Alfchurch, but we cover the whole of the UK. Um, we provide communication support for deaf people to access um, events and services and products. And our newest innovation is a video interpreting service that enables deaf people to call organisations or access them in person via our app. There's 9 million um, deaf and hard of hearing people within the UK and the Midlands um, Engine Investment Fund has enabled us to communicate that to more people so that they can make themselves more accessible and deaf people don't encounter barriers on a daily basis. I think in the past we've found it very difficult to get bank managers to understand about our business and how we want to grow the business, whereas that's been quite easy to understand for Midven um, and they've saw and shared our vision of how to grow the business, which has been really helpful. At the point of investment, we had around 17 members of staff. We've already increased that since January to um, 20 members of staff. And we've still got another four positions that are advertised. So uh, we're growing quite rapidly. And I definitely recommend the process to somebody else. It's very straightforward and, and quite easy to do. Okay, I think it's really useful to hear from uh, businesses that actually received that investment. So it's, um, there's lots more of those case studies on our website. Um, and just to share my previous slide screen with you. 
So the British Business Bank has other resources that can help you. Like I say, there's lots of support and advice and lots of options for you out there. Um, the Finance Hub, um, we've invested in our own kind of platform build out and, 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 and tech infrastructure. So this now has regional pages. So you can drill down into what's going on in the West Midlands, what support is available for you in the West Midlands. Uh, and the Business Finance Guide, um, that equity versus debt slide that I showed you earlier, that's taken directly from there. So a lot more information. Um, about the support that's out there in terms of investment in your business. And these are the links um, to the things that I've mentioned today, the Finance Hub, Startup Loans, Midlands Engine Investment Fund, the Business Finance Guide and the Growth Hub Contacts. And that just leads me to hand back to Nicola uh, for closing comments. Thank you very much, Nicola. Thank you very much, Ryan. Um, and if any of our attendees would like to learn more about what we'll discuss today, or if there's any international companies that are viewing who, again, would like to learn why the West Midlands could be perfect for their business, please get in touch. I've put our contact details um, into the chat box. We are also on YouTube for this session, um, so you can view back at that any point in time. Um, and I look forward to really hearing from you. Thank you so much for all of our speakers. It was a really jam-packed session. We have overrun, uh, but I think it was worth it. We you know, shared so much opportunity uh, and so much support that's available here. Um, so please feel free, anybody to get in touch with us. And if you'd like to reach any of our speakers, um, contact me and I can, I can create those introductions for you. Um, so thank you again, everybody. Enjoy the last day of Birmingham Tech Week. Again, thank you to the Department for International Trade for helping our session. Um, and have a great day and a great weekend, everybody. Thank you. Thanks.